Hey folks, welcome back to Compound Interests. I am John Najarian, your host, and I'm delighted to have the founder of Reddit's Wall Street Bets, Jamie Rogozinski. And Jamie, by the way, I played football with a guy named Rogo. Um, really? And he was a Rogozinski too, but uh, I doubt if it uh, is a direct relative, but it's mm, you what are are the second odds? Rogo that I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite a coincidence. I've never met a rogue Zinsky, so for what it's worth, you're, you're doing better than I am. Uh, well, I don't know if I'm doing better than you. Um, you're down there in, uh, in Mexico at an undisclosed location, and uh, <laughs> I love that place. I, Jamie, I used to go back and forth every two weeks in the 90s, uh, late yeah. 80s into the you know late 90s before Lehman Brothers and Citigroup stole all my clients. <laughs> yep, yep. But I used to go down there and help people because uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Mexican banks weren't considered all that safe. And so to get people to leave money in the banks, they had to pay on these setes, I think they called them, Jamie, they had to pay in the neighborhood of 30 percent uh, on your money. So some people would leave, you know, a portion of their net worth in the bank to make 30%, of course. Um, and the rest of them wanted help from me to put their money in banks in Houston or Miami. Those were the two most popular spots. So I did that as well as facilitating some trades in the likes of Telmex and a lot of the big Mexican ADRs because they traded in Mexico yep. and it was like a 10 to one conversion from yep. that stock, you know, back and forth and back and forth. And that went on all day. So, yep, I mean, yep, yep. that was manna from heaven for a while. <laughs> until, like I say, Lehman and yeah. Sid pretty much yeah. cleaned me out. You know, Me Mexico is a great place. And it certainly has, uh, has evolved from that point. At that point, uh, you know, at this point, you have banks that are, that, it, that it is, it's opened up to the private um, industry. So you got international banks that are big names that everybody knows about. But, you know, overall, I'm super happy here. I've been living here for about six years. It's a wonderful place. You know, this past year has been all about uh, the coronavirus and the lockdowns or whatever. So it's, I think anywhere in the world has been kind of a, a tricky place, but the people are wonderful. The food is great. You know, it's, I, I love it here. Well, first I'm going to ask you about your trading um, because as I said at the top, uh, one of the many things Jamie has done folks, he's also written a book and we'll get to that, but uh, it was of course the thing he's famous for right now is Wall Street bets. And uh, Jamie was the founder. And obviously, Jamie, you were a trader. I mean, I read about you before I saw, before Wall Street Bets blew up like this. But I remember yeah. reading about you and you were not that happy with a lot of the uh, chat rooms with a lot of the, I mean, you can certainly glean a lot from the internet. But, yep. you know, there's a lot of folks, including me, who are out there selling something. I'm selling education, I'm selling subscriptions, um, I'm selling wealth management and that sort of thing. But you were saying, well, isn't there a different way or isn't there someplace else or something that you could create even that could become that forum where people could actually learn and so forth. So I don't wanna put words in your mouth. Please tell us about the genesis of Wall Street Bets. Yeah, I mean, here, here's the thing. As you were as you were asking your question, you know, the first thing that kind of came to mind is this word "trader." Uh, I think that's that's kind of going to have a new definition uh, relatively shortly. So the answer is yes. Look, I, I started playing with stocks. You know, I, I, let's say let's say I started investing in. I bought shares in Google back in, whenever they IPO'd. Uh, you know, and dabbled a little bit here and there, but. Right around 2010, 2012, I started getting into, uh, I started taking interest in, in stock options and taking these high risk, uh, short term, uh, high risk, high return type trades, which resembles that of, of traders. And I took interest. I said, look, I got extra money. I don't mind if I lose it. I know it's risky. I get it. Um, you know, let's go ahead and, and see if I can make something more out of it. You know, let's go ahead and, and I, I can afford it, that, uh, you know, and, and so I did. And, and I, you know, I, I found little bits and pieces that I wanted, but what I really wanted is a group of people that could talk about the stock market in, in a way that they can make some quick money, lose quick money, you know, have fun doing it. I didn't want to get my CFA level three, you know, I just wanted to, <laughs> to, to, to figure these things out. 
uh, you know, glad I didn't try to get my CFA level three. That's, you know, it's got its own relevance, right? I'm not going to knock it. Every discipline has a place. Uh, growth value investors have their place. Traders have their place. And, and, and that's kind of where I categorize myself in. I did learn how to trade the conventional way. You're looking at different technical analysis chart patterns. You're looking at, you know, some people do news, some people do like statistical algorithmic types. Like I learned about all of them and I kind of figure out my style. But Wall Street Bets kind of took on a life of its own. You know, it, 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 as it grew, a lot of people became interested in it. They, they've developed a new genre of market participants. You know, what I'm starting to call these meme stocks or meme traders where they're, they're not even bothering and they're not, they're unapologetic about the fact they don't care about what's under the hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I don't blame them really, Jamie, because a lot of times, um, when I'm on CNBC and they want to talk about something and they say, well, so John, what have you changed about your investment outlook today? And I'm like, nothing, nothing. <laughs> well, 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 why? Uh, aren't you reacting to this or this or what about this EBITDA or whatever? And I'm like, I don't care. I said, I am totally a surfer. I am that guy who wants to feel the wave pick up, Jamie, and as the wave's picking up, that's the direction I paddle. I paddle where that wave is going. And it's not yeah. that dissimilar from what you've done with what just a few days ago was 2 million, and now it's over 4 million, I guess. Um, it, it's just amazing to see the growth of Wall Street bets, but I think it's similar in many ways because, um, yeah, sure, I look a little bit under the hood, uh, for instance, I'm digging in there a little, Jamie, to figure, okay, is somebody speaking at a conference tomorrow that I that I know of? I can check real quick and see, okay, yeah, they're speaking at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference. Okay, so maybe that's why shares are moving today. They're speaking at 2 o'clock tomorrow, and a bunch of hedge funds are buying into it. Okay, I'm, I, I'll ride that wave and so forth. But a lot of times, there's no reason. And I've never really seen the company that much before. I mean, yeah. dozens and dozens of these companies that make some of the biggest returns are stocks that if I sat there trying to break down the company, I yeah. would never buy it. But I'm not yeah. buying it for the long term. I'm trading it for X amount of minutes, days, weeks. That's about as far out as I go. Other than that, yeah. I have my long term portfolio of stuff that I just hold. I bet you do, too. I bet you've yeah. got... Stocks like Google and Apple and things like that. I, you know, I, I trade index funds. You know, I trade index uh, index futures and, and foreign exchange. It's you know, partly because I'm in Mexico and it's a lot easier uh, to do that here. But I did, I did trade back when I was still living in the U.S. I did trade individual stocks and I did trade uh, stock options and, and I did the exact. Look, I know, I know the, I know how that works, right? There's waves and you're not trying to to do anything other than just get on it. You don't know why or whatever. You don't care. You just want to surf it down and, and, and it's something that's you know that, that's been done. Uh, successfully for a long time. What's what's interesting about this particular situation is that these guys they're coming in here and they're creating waves, right? This is yep. this is different. What we're looking at now hasn't been done before, hasn't been studied before. It's it, people are all eyes on this particular situation. Obviously, there's conversations to be had about the regulatory implications or whatever, and you can have that conversation if you want. But the fact is, they're creating these waves, they're riding these waves, they're making money, you know, with these waves and. And they're doing it, having fun. And they, you know, they, a, a regular trader cares about the execution of the trade. You have a spread, you know, you're bidding your ask, and you have, you, you know, the, you want a limit or a market order, the slippage, the whatever, you know, there's, there's the liquidity. You know, these things matter because they do matter when you're making a lot of these trades, depending on your style and your frequency, whatever. But it's things that you care about. You're looking at these bar charts, you know, as far as trying to figure out the price action. These, these, this, this new group of people, they don't care. They don't pretend to care. They're using brokers that have the worst possible execution imaginable. They have, they're paying crazy spreads, delayed quotes. They're hitting market order all day long. I don't think they know what limit means. And they don't care because they're creating this massive wave. So what they miss out on a few bucks, right? They're making, they're turning a thousand dollars into a hundred thousand dollars or $50,000 into $50 million. They don't care if they got three cents on the bid ask spread. They don't care, uh, you know, if the, the execution got screwed up. They're going for these grand slams 
and they, they they don't even have bar charts. That's you know, Robin Hood, you pull it up and it's a line chart. So there's not they don't even they don't even care. They're just wondering why there's a line instead of a just a price, you know, as far as they're concerned. They know that it's going up or they know it's going down. They place their bet and they and they do it without even considering, you know, they're doing stock options. Options are super complicated. I have a huge appreciation for them. I, I understand them. I've studied them. These guys open up their broker. They scroll down to whichever one they can afford. They see, well, I, I think call options are the ones that make the market go up. I got 500 bucks in my account. This one I can afford. They, they're not looking at strike X, but they don't even care what that means. They purchase it. They don't know Delta. They don't know Gamma. They don't know Vega. They don't know. They don't care. They're making a bet. And then Robinhood, uh, in particular, they they kind of you know do their part and say, okay, you're about to buy a stock option, right? This is complicated stuff. Uh, and, and you're buying a call, just to make sure, do you think the stock's going to go up or do you think it's going to go down? And, and the answer with an arrow, with a color-coded green arrow to, to, to verify their request for buying something you know, that has the famous black shoals behind these mathematical, they don't care. They click the button, they're going for these moves. It's a new thing and it works. Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, I, I was absolutely amazed um, because, uh, uh, well, Chamath was on with us uh, yesterday, I guess. Um, and he'd been on CNBC and talking about other things, mainly about social capital. But then, of course, on Tuesday, I think, Jamie, he put out, hey, February 115s, I'm in, let's do this, or something like that. <laughs> and, you know, the, the Wall Street bets crowd, the WSBs, yeah, let's go, let's run. <laughs> You know, they went crazy and the stock took off. And all I did was put on a, uh, a put trade out in April and just said, you know what? I'm just going to set this one. And like that Ron Popeil commercial, I'm going to set it and forget it. Just going <laughs> to put on this spread from 60 all the way down to 30 or whatever. And if we don't come back down to 60 between now and April, okay, I lose money, yeah. um, maybe 40 grand. Um, on the other hand, and I had, I think all in, I was maybe half a million in positions to do that. But the net out of pocket that I'd lose was, like I said, um, on the other hand, if we make a move to the downside and it happens after March expiration, I could have, a, you know, for me anyway, a home run, not, not for Wall Street bets. <laughs> for those I guys, know. it's <laughs> For me, well, there's, th this yeah. particular trade would be five or six to one. Maybe I make two or 300,000 bucks on it. And we're going to give, by the way, and I'm sticking to this, we're going to give whatever we make on this trade to uh, Barstool Fund, um, Dave Portnoy's group, which, by the way, you look a little bit like Portnoy. <laughs> okay, that's the <laughs> first. Because you've got, you know, the, you got yeah. the, the little bit of scruff going on here. Yep, yep, you know, yep. Tightly trimmed beard and all that. But anyway, um, just because I think Dave's doing God's work with that fund, um, yep, yep. you know, helping out small businesses and things like that. And yep. we figured, okay, let's do this. All of a sudden the Wall Street bets guys just attacked me. <laughs> like I was Citron <laughs> or like I was um, Melvin Capital and, uh, uh, you know, Gabe. They just went for me. They're just like, we're going to eat you, John. We're going to, you know, F you. We're going to do all this. It's a yeah. crazy community. It is crazy community. It is an entertaining community. And it's it's interesting because it's you've been in this game for a while. You understand the dynamics of having two people on the trade. There's a sense of competition, you know, and I'm gonna be right, you're gonna be wrong, and I'm gonna win and you're gonna lose. And that that exists everywhere. It exists on Wall Street and exists on Wall Street bets. Uh, and you know, it's the typical locker room banter, but now you have these massive amounts of people, they need to have a nemesis. Look at you know, right now I get these questions about, so what do you think of the movement and they're going after the short sellers and finally the little guys are, you know, these guys are, the short sellers are bad and they're finally learning their lesson. I'm sitting there laughing to myself saying, sure, I don't think they started it as a movement. It's certainly turning into something interesting. I'm, I, I'm very fascinated because now we have a conversation that's worth having. But uh, this whole short sellers bad versus Wall Street get bets good. Just wait until these stocks start turning around. I can't predict what's going to happen, but let's just go with the fact that let's go with the assumption that at some point these stocks will go back down. When they, if they do, and if and when they do, 
the crowd at Wall Street bets is nimble. They're going to switch their minds. They're going to be like, well, let's buy puts and ride this little guy down. And they're going to make money on both directions. And all of a sudden, the bad guy is them too. Like they, you know, and they did that effectively when the last year and the, the pandemic started, the markets took a huge hit. You know, everyone knows they were buying puts. And, uh, you know, you know this when the stocks crash, they do it fast and they do it much faster than when they go back up, you know, how elevator in the stairs. Uh, they made so much money cheering on the end of the world and the terrible economic news that they felt guilty and they started donating some of their profits, right? And then they switched around and, you know, there's a little tug of war when the, when the market turns around and then that's when you get that spirit of debate within them. And then everyone says, all right, cool, now we're in the bull market again. Let's buy calls. Stocks go up. They only go up, you know, and, and, and they love this and they enjoy it until it's their time to put the, push the other button on the screen that, 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 that changes the direction of the trade. You know they're in it to make some money period you know so that's it's it's yeah, it's interesting oh yeah and uh i tell you what um you know one of the first iterations of this in you know in a big way anyway was stock twits stock yep. twits but it was it's nothing still is nothing like this but uh stock twits howard linson and these guys created this forum um they even created the cash tag you know the dollar sign in front of the stock um, and then Jack Dorsey just said, okay, fine. We'll, we'll search via the cash sign and we'll make it part of our algorithm and all this kind of stuff. And Howard didn't get anything for that. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody was like, well, why do I need to be in stock twits if I can just, you know, put the cash tag in front of GME and all of a sudden I see everything that's written about GME by everybody, which yep, yep, yep. You know, pretty much uh, ended what was uh, a, a walled garden that Howard had for uh, stock twits and so forth. But yours, when you say memes and so forth, I couldn't believe it. I was on Wall Street Bets a week ago, even before this big run. And yep. um, as I was on there, I'm seeing all these guys posting up things from John Wick, you know, little, little, you know, four second to several minute long clips of John Wick of uh, the 300, of Braveheart, of any of these things, you know, basically trying to steal all the other, and I don't mean steal as in take, I mean steal as in get tough, all the other traders in this thing's like, let's get them, you know. And, that, and that's their argument for the trade. Keep that in mind, right? Like you have the value, the people doing cash, discounted cash flow analysis and doing the EBITDA and doing the, and, you know, and then you have the technical analyst going, you know, depending on your strategy, you got the head and shoulders, whatever. You got the quants going, the standard deviations, got the mean reverting, whatever. And these guys are posting pictures of John Wick saying, this is what we're doing. And, 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 it's, and it's real. And they're having an actual effect. Uh, and they're making real money. And they're having, you know, they're, they're participating just like the other ones. And, and that's a thing now. And that's a thing that's here to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, when, when I first posted about Chamath and uh, Wall Street bets and so forth, like I say, I got attacked by, by, by the crowd, by the WSPs, um, which is fine. But uh, yeah. I think they somewhat misunderstood, too, because I'm not against the retail guy. And I'm certainly not in favor or I, I, I respect the hedge fund community, but I'm, I don't put them up on a pedestal. Um, I think these men and women in Wall Street bets, and I have a very strong feeling, Jamie, that it skews heavily to the male side, but I'm sure there are some great female traders on there too. Um, I think they are putting their money on, their, on the line um, in much greater uh, percentages than any hedge fund guy, you know, even Gabe over at Melvin. I'm sure he didn't put his net worth on that trade. You know, he's managing other people's money. He's taken two and 20 or three and 30 or, you know, because he's been very successful. I'm sure it's a high number. Um, and, you know, when he loses, yeah, he loses. And it, he's got to get it back to that watermark before he can start participating in any of that 20% or 30% of the upside that he's able to glean for these guys. But my gosh, um, they have, you know, you know they, big... They, they, Big brass ones over there. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they said, they have a what was it? They called it the the personal risk tolerance. Is kind of a joke that, that took place after a, an incident. Yeah, they have they have a huge risk tolerance, and yeah. you know, 
you think a little bit about that mentality, though, I, the, there's you see everything, all right? You see people that do take irresponsible decisions. You look, at, and then you look at people that just do it with paper trading accounts on the other extreme. Uh, but the majority of the things that I see are people that are taking their extra money and they're trying to to, to hit big, and they buy these these options and these options have a defined downside for the most part let's just let's say that they're going long options they have a defined downside unlimited upside and uh, you know they hit big sometimes so you take a thousand dollars and you turn that into a hundred thousand you take fifty thousand you turn that into 50 million then they got there because they traded uh, a small amount of money for, but yesterday they were worth whatever they were worth today they're worth 50 million dollars more that doesn't register right away. That money is not quite there yet. It's it's all right to put some profits on the line, all right? And so when you see people making these outlandish trades, you know, they're using house money if you want to use it that way. But, you know, I, I this this whole retail versus not retail, but like to me, it's it's uh, it's it's a non-issue because the retail, look, the, the funds, obviously Melvin had some issues. Uh, we know that, but we don't know what's going on with the other guys. And the other guys have been around the block a lot, a lot longer than these retail traders. So we don't know whether they're actually winning or losing against these guys. They are just as capable of buying calls, you know, to hedge their short position and ride it both ways as well. You know, we don't know what they're doing. Uh, we know that they're not new to this game. And, uh, and so let's give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but, but on the other hand, you know, you have these, these retail traders that are, not the establishment they've busted the door open into this invite only party and they're partying along with this you know with these uh these people that previously weren't there but they're doing the same thing everyone that's participating in this in the market wants to make money there's no two ways about it like there's long term you know slow whatever let's collect dividends catch up with inflation sure how about it you know, there's the traders, same thing. Nobody's nobody's coming in here. These guys, you could argue that they're doing it for the fun as well, because uh, because they are having fun. So if they lose money, they get the same utility out of uh, out of it that if you go to a casino. But uh, it's 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 interesting. I think this rivalry is a natural rivalry. I don't think there's an inherent you know hate between the participants. I think more of these labels start getting assigned by outsiders. That look at this and say. Well, there you have a you know little Joe Schmo that's you know trading from his parents' basement or whatever, and then you have like the, the suits as they're starting to call them uh, that, that work at these big name uh, firms, and, uh, and 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 it's easier for them to to come up with this uh, you know the, the the story of saying it's David on one side, it's Goliath on the other. I think that there's a lot of pent up feelings that got saved up from the Occupy Wall Street movement. You know, a lot of people were upset. obviously it was a completely different time. It has nothing to do with what happened back then. People then were burnt. They were up. They were upset. There was genuine anger at the ninety-nine percent. I don't think that that anger fueled anything yet, but I think that anger is coming out uh, because a lot of people remember it, and they're saying, "Finally, you know, somebody's hitting back Wall Street." And I think that's why you're seeing the politicians come in. That's why you're seeing big names, you got Mark Cuban, you got you know, whatever. I, I've lost track of how many people are weighing in on this story, and that's why. Yeah, and now we got Portnoy going head to head with Stevie Cohen. You know, they're just going like this on Twitter. Um, I which love is him. Great. It's great yep, yep. to see. <laughs> He's great, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, uh, when 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 you were trading on there, um, were you posting up most of your trades as well, Jamie, or were you just saying I'm buying a? I mean, did you disclose to the group? Uh, because unfortunately, when you were active on there, and you've left there, and we'll get to that, but. You're the founder of Wall Street Bets. Um, at some point in there, were you one of those guys posting up your trades? You know, because some of the guys post up pictures, some of them post up, uh, you know, hey, I just bought 500 of these or a thousand of this or 10 of that, whatever it, you know their account might be. Were you? You know, I, I I did I did participate, but it's just it's not even fair anymore. I might as well say no. Uh, but but the answer is back in the day it was a yes. You know back in the day when when things were outlandish, is if you made two thousand dollars that was a big deal. If you risked two thousand dollars that was a big deal. I, you know I I'm trying to make memory of this. I remember you know I bought uh, what was it Facebook when they IPO'd and I don't know if you remember what happened at that point. But 
uh, the stock tank, and a guy, and it was stuck at, I forget, it was 38 or 42 or something like that. It was being held up by Morgan Stanley. You know, it was kind of an interesting thing. I thought that was kind of cool. And I really wanted to buy, as it was coming down, I, I really wanted to buy a share at the actual IPO price, you know, which IPO prices are usually not available to the, to the general public. So I, I, the novelty side, I don't know, I didn't you know, put in a hundred shares and, Hey guys, look what I did. I bought Facebook at the lowest possible value, right? Uh, you know, uh, and, and then I might've put in a couple of trades where, where, where I made some money, I lost some money. Um, but it's not, it's not even fair because what they're doing now is so much different uh, in every respect that, that, than, than what we did back then. Now they're posting tremendous amounts of money. They're taking insanely uh, risky, but very entertaining and sometimes very sophisticated bets. You mentioned the spread. I don't think they get enough attention for, for spread. They, they do trade these things, um, you know, and sometimes in very sophisticated manners, which is really intriguing, uh, you know, but they, uh, I, I did, but it doesn't count. I guess that's my answer. Well, now, so tell me, you're the ringleader. You're the moderator. You started Wall Street Bets. How is it that, that you're not still there? I mean, was it kind of a negotiation? Was it a, hey, Jamie, the world is changing and we don't want you? How did that work out that they pushed you out of something that you created or did you just choose to leave? Yeah, I, I was the ringleader. I was the moderator. Uh, that, that's not the case, as you just said. Um, yeah, I created the thing. I grew the thing. I, you know, I, I participated. I, I helped shape uh, a lot of the the, the tone and, and the, the overall dynamics towards it. Um, uh, a lot of it, you know, and I'm not going to take credit for a ton of it because when I very when I started at the very beginning, I'm micromanaged, and I said, no, 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 the logo has to look like this, or you know, let's not do a chat room because you know then we're going to have issues with identity confirmation. But, you know, and I really cared about every tiny little detail. And then, and then I don't know what happened, but one day I kind of flipped the switch and I said, you know what? Other people, I don't know everything. I'm not the best at everything. In fact, I'm sure that there are people that are better. So I started putting on some, some additional moderators that were in their own way, really different. Some are really funny. Some are really knowledgeable. Some are just random. And, uh, and I kind of let them do their thing and, and, and hands off, you know, my, my, I, I would get involved when, I felt I needed to, you know, sometimes on, on Reddit, you'd see things or on Wall Street Bets, you'd see things that were blatantly illegal, you know, where there's no gray area, somebody posts inside information, somebody tries to do a pump and dump scheme. Uh, and I'd, I'd come down pretty heavy on that because obviously didn't want to put the subreddit at risk. Uh, you know, and sometimes I chimed into the conversations and sometimes I helped lead them, but, but really it, a, a lot of what it's turned into today is because the community turned it into that, you know, by no means, um, uh, can I take credit for that? It's, it's, it's all them, uh, you know, and, and as this process starts growing, the, the, the subreddit starts growing, the number of moderators start growing, everything's great. And, uh, and then up until last year, last year, I decided I was going to make, this is before the pandemic. I, I realized the trajectory of the market and the market participants, people are already starting to treat this like a video game, uh, and a casino and, uh, they're using language of a video game. So I had this idea of creating a live esports style trading competition. I got the biggest esports stadium in the US rented out. I was going to have you know, a live audience. We're going to broadcast it where we had you know, 10 or 12 individuals that would trade with real money, of you know, their own money and their own accounts, a set of rules to try and make it interesting uh, using stock options and, and see who makes the most. Or you know, some people joke about who would lose the least. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and I was kind of working towards that of course, coronavirus kind of came in, but that but that was a little bit after the past. A after I started announcing this this competition uh, of merging the worlds of esports as well as trading, uh, I decided to do a little bit of house cleaning. Uh, there were, uh, you know, I don't want to get too much into the details because it kind of skews from the conversation. But but there's uh, certain uh, moderators that were that were using uh, unpalatable moderation style. So I so I started cutting down on this there was a chat room that just wasn't very good incidentally that chat room which you know it's basically unfiltered hate speech was taking place i, I guess it got taken down yesterday because of that same reason so i've taken down that that thing we bumped heads and uh they you know they they, they got together and they made the argument to reddit that i 
has violated some type of rule, um, you know, as far as the, the moderation in terms of service. Uh, and and they made their case. Reddit then pretty much removed me as a as a moderator. They told me, "Hey, you violated the rules. I'm sorry, you can't moderate here anymore." Uh, and that's the end of the story. I tried contacting Reddit. I sent them numerous messages. They've heard from friends. They've heard from contacts. They've heard from lawyers. They've never answered me. So the actual reason why they removed me, they've never told me. I'd love to know. Uh, but because it's tied into this trading competition, I'm thinking that uh, that I had to do something with that. Uh, and so anyway, so I've so I've been gone since last April. But to be honest with you, you know, w- uh, seeing as what's happening right now, I I'm glad I'm not involved. <laughs> this is a really interesting situation to say the least. I do not envy any of the moderators on Wall Street bets. I'd hate to know if, you know, I'd, I'd be curious or be worried if any of the moderators of Wall Street bets were actually involved in some of these trades that are taking place because that that's, raises some interesting questions given that they can control some of the conversations. But, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy I'm watching this as a neutral observer. I obviously have intimate knowledge of, of both the subreddit and the industry and things like that. Um, uh, and, and, and that's pretty much that, you know, when it comes to had I stayed as a moderator, most likely we wouldn't have gotten to this place. And this is kind of a cool thing that we're at, right? Like what we're seeing right now, this, this movement, this conversation, that's one that I felt has always needed to take place. That's part of the reason why I wrote the book. That's actually part of the motivation for this stock trading competition. I'm trying to point out how ludicrous it was on to piss people off about turning their profession into a video game. Uh, hoping to spark a conversation. So they, so that's what's taking place now. I'm happy that conversation is taking place. Uh, and I acknowledge that this would not have happened if I was still moderating that subreddit because I did stop that. In fact, I'm pretty sure CNN tonight is going to have another moderator uh, on, I forget which program, Aaron Burnett, if I'm not mistaken, it's, that, that was part of this uh, cutting down of this this uh, uh, things, but somebody tried these types of trades last year. Uh, we detected it, we blocked it, uh, and and that was that. These moderators have a different philosophy. I'm glad they did it because this conversation is is awesome. I'm glad I have nothing to do with it because I do not want you know. That's why I'm on TV showing my face. I have nothing to worry about, and, and, and you know, uh, I have a bittersweet relationship with with uh, uh, with that old situation. Um. It's amazing, but there are 5.1 million degenerates on there right now. Uh, (laughs) I mean, it went, folks, from, for those of you unfamiliar with it, a little over 2 point something million last week, last week, to 5.1 million right now. I mean, oh, my God. And you want to know something scarier? You know, since I'm not the moderator, I I don't have access to this information anymore. But when I still was last year, you know, we were at about a million and the traffic to that website is higher on, you know, like multiple orders, you know, the exponential level. I I don't remember. I have them somewhere. I should find them. But let's say that we had a million users. We would get five million unique user visitors a day. These are people that don't have Reddit accounts. They don't register. You don't have to do that to be a member. There's no, there's no membership fee. There's no terms of service. There's no initiation. Pro, you know, you simply need to hang out there. You have to read that stuff, and you want to do whatever they're doing. So, if you take into account the number of people that are not registered Reddit accounts that hit the subscribe button, uh, I guarantee you, it's much higher than that. You know, oh, by yeah. a factor of at least five. That's so incredible. I know you're right. I know you're right. I mean, several ways I know he's right, folks. Number one, um, my brother Pete and I, we track options every day, track option volumes. Um, Yesterday, Jamie, we traded 60 million contracts. Oh, shoot. I've been using 38 as a number. My bad. Yeah. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) We're averaging in January 43 million. That's according to the OCC's website, 43 million option contracts. So clearly, it's more than the now 5 million people on there. And not all of those 5 million are trading options, of course. A lot of them are just trading stock. But for those that are trading options, I'm sure the number is really high. Uh, But now let's get to the elephant in the room as well, Jamie. Regulation, not of Wall Street bets, although they tried to come down hard on what? Discord and on uh, uh, Reddit. 
they basically tried to, you know, shut it down. And no, 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 that wasn't the case. No, that, that, that didn't happen. That was the person, okay. look, you know, I, I, in the eight years that I was there, taking the subreddit private is something that was done on a somewhat regular basis. You know, this is the highest profile it's ever been. So it's obviously got a lot of interpretation. Sure. But they would take the, you know, back when I was in charge, we would take the, the, the subreddit private, sometimes because we were making updates to the site, maybe the look and feel or whatever, sometimes because uh, of administrative reasons. But uh, most often than not, it was just kind of a stunt. It's a publicity thing. It's, oh, no, we're under the, ra you know, we're under the radar with the SEC. Let's go ahead and start a rumor mill. It gets attention. Clearly, it gets attention. I, you know, it's, it's, it's people just have to speculate. The fact of the matter is, if the SEC wanted to shut down Wall Street bets, it wouldn't email one of the moderators and tell them to switch the setting to private you know they, if they wanted to shut it down they go to reddit themselves and they say reddit please get rid of it and you're no longer going to get a message that says the subreddit is private you're going to get a message that says sorry not found um so if this was a government action that's what you can expect to happen not this whole private thing and the discord situation it goes back to what i was making reference to earlier unfortunately you know there was just a uh, the discord is was its own little uh, bubble and it took on its a life of its own and it was ran by by different moderators and uh, they you know they were cool with certain types of language and certain types of conversations that I wasn't cool with uh, and apparently they're not cool with as well I tried to, to get rid of that discord you can go back and look at all the different posts around the time of my removal and you'll notice that I put my own up there then removed his and uh, you know, and so I guess Discord on their own decided, hey, you know, this is just not not right. Maybe it's because of the times that we're in, maybe because of what we're seeing, you know, on the social standpoint with with you know with, with hate speech. Uh, well, for whatever reason, they they got rid of that Discord for the same reason that I was trying to get rid of it. So nothing to do with the SEC. But if we want to talk about the SEC, I'm happy to do that. It's fascinating. Well, let's talk about uh, Robinhood. I'm looking at my. Uh messages right now, I see that Robinhood is saying they're going to allow limited, in quotes, limited uh, buying of restricted securities, restricted securities. Now, Jamie, um, you know, you're younger than me, but I, I know you remember the um, financial crisis of 2008, 9, 10, um, and it was built around houses and, uh, you know, people owning too much and being over levered and Michael Burry and others took big advantage of that. And by the way, Michael Burry has been posting up a lot about Wall Street bets and then he takes them right down half the time. <laughs> but, you know, Mike, Michael's got that brain on, like mine, I guess, you know, dyslexia or ADHD, whatever it is. Yeah. But um, when you're looking at uh, uh, Robin Hood and they're saying, okay, you guys can't trade GameStop. Um, I have a, an opinion about why that occurred, but when the, the financial crisis was occurring, they never said to Remax or to Zillow or to any of the sites that were around then, oh, you can't advertise houses anymore. Can't advertise houses in Florida because everybody's trying to sell them. You can't, you know what I mean? So to shut down a market just because you don't like the, the way things are going um, is a really odd thing. So for instance, I don't think it was because Robin Hood didn't like that people were making money. I'm sure they're fine with people making money, yep. but Robin Hood is a zero commission platform. They sell that order form, meaning that every time somebody wants to buy 10 contracts of an option, they have to sell that contract, those 20 contracts, those 10 contracts, whatever it is, to somebody, a high frequency firm. I don't need to name them. Um, that high frequency firm pays for the right or for the opportunity to trade against somebody that they think is dumb and slow. And so they uh, pay you 50 cents a contract. So for that 10 lot that cost you nothing, if you're a Robinhood trader, um, Robinhood got paid and Robinhood gets millions of dollars a day from exactly that. And I'm not pointing my finger at them saying, you guys are bad because you did that, but that's their business model, right? All of a yeah. sudden, one of those buyers tells them, you know what? We're not going to pay you anymore on GameStop. We're not going to pay you an AMC. We're not going to pay you for, you know, I've got all of mine here, MAC for AMCX. You know, we're not going to pay you on any of those. What does Robinhood do? They, they say, well, we can't let you trade those. 
Otherwise, we'll lose money on every it, single trade if we have yeah. to pay somebody to execute it. And put it on the exchange. Opinion. Is that is that actually what happened? Because I had a whole opinion lined up until the end of your question over there. Um, okay. And I, I, I'll well, be honest with time. you. I started at 6 o'clock this morning, and I'm working on my breakfast. Uh, I haven't had a chance to t take a deep dive, so I'm going to take this knowledge from you. Is that what's happening? Is it these, these guys on the back end that are taking the order flows that are deciding to cut them off, or is it something else, or is it still speculating? Because that depends on um, my answer. Uh, my answer is that it's still unclear what the exact reasons are. Gotcha. I mean, okay. you could move up margin, Jamie. You could move mm -hmm. up margin. Yep. Um, but when you're buying an option, as you and I both know, when you buy an option, you're fully paying for the option. Um, no, I, I get it. I know how it works. Like the, the, here's the deal. So I'm, I'm going to pretend that you didn't say that because, uh, you know, I have my opinion based off of what I assume, right? Okay. My assumption is, and I understand what you're talking about. And by the way, these people that are processing these order flows in the background, like we're not naming, I won't name it. I'll take your lead on that one. That's this whole interesting, uh, very interesting topic all in and of itself. And we can save that one if we have time, but what do I think is happening? I don't believe that Robin hood would, you know, I don't believe that Robin Hood chose to do this. And, I, and I'm saying this because we saw this yesterday with other brokers that do charge commissions. Uh, I believe that this thing is getting away from the regulators or whoever you want to put, you know, this thing is worrying people. This is abnormal. I don't care who you are, what perspective it is. You know, it's legal, it's not legal regulation. Sure, have that debate later. But is it normal? No, I don't think anyone agrees with that. So they're trying to contain this thing, and it's difficult. I don't envy the, the, the SEC or FINRA, whoever else is taking a look at this. They have an impossible situation, but they're trying to contain this thing. I do believe that there are forces at play behind it that have pressured Robin Hood into doing this. Why do I think that? Because Robin Hood has been through everything with their customers, and they've, you know, they were down last. You know, they, they had outages last year when the stock markets were crashing, or when they were going back up, and they cost their users all sorts of money because they're still kind of a young growing, you know, they're going through some growing pains and the customers stuck with them. They love them. You know, they're like, whatever, I lost some money. We'll try again tomorrow. Uh, they have terrible execution. You know, just like you said, uh, the customer, you know, the people use, they don't care about that. They're, I don't care if you, you know, front running me. I just, just, you know, go attendees. Right. Uh, and they know this Robin Hood has I gone after this. Death. Death. I yeah, love the term <laughs> you know, Robin Hood knows this. They know their place in the world. They used to, it's, in my book, when I was doing research going back in the early days of their advertising, I saw them put an ad on Facebook with a street sign that said YOLO on it. And, you know, it said Robin Hood it said, earning season is coming up. You know, don't miss out, right? Like, and of course, earning season being a great gambling opportunity. So they embrace their role in this thing. They don't hide the fact that they're letting these kids go through with this. They've had big profile hiccups, if we want to be generous, uh, you know, with, with infinite margin things. And they did get in trouble for the order flow transparency issues. They don't care. They know that their customers are and they're making money and they have a huge audience. They don't have a reason to piss them off, right? Like, I don't think they would have woke up, up this morning and said, we should do the right thing. And, and stop them, or, or let's go ahead and go with a merit trades lead and do it. I, I believe they were pressured. That's that's common sense to me. Your explanation is another very viable explanation, which I had not considered, and that would change my answer to it. But assuming that, that I'm right, I think that's what's taking place. Um, it's it's uh, you know it, it, it's it's Robin Hood knows their place in the world, and I think they very much do side with these retail traders. I think if they could, if the PR people would allow it to, they'd be who on this entire thing too. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of uh, uh, of that, of who hawing and so forth, tell me a little bit about. Now, as I said, folks, Jamie's written a book. Um, it's going to be really hard to find. I've got it right here. Um, it is. Uh, called Wall Street Bets, how boomers <laughs> made the world's <laughs> Anyway, you can find it on um, Amazon, which is where I got it. Um, and I was reading about world chaos. Yeah. And tell us a little story. I think that'll help sell your book too, Jamie. <laughs> tell us a little bit about world chaos. Yeah. So, you know, what I, what I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I set off to write this book and I had this idea that had been kind of brewing for years. And it was kind of my take on what's happening with the market. You know, I, yes, I'm a participant. Yes, I started Wall Street. That's yes, I was going to make a mockery of it with this esports competition. Uh, 
but I was also intrigued, right? I too was trying to start this conversation that we're having today. And that, and one of my motivations for this trading competition was just that. Um, I wanted to just point out the ludic, how, how, how things have gotten away from the original attention of the market. So the book, you know, it's got two tones. The one is, is discussing kind of the background and what's happening, what's the history, and it goes towards where we're headed. And, and it really points out a lot of idiosyncrasies as far as what takes place. And I use stories from users in Wall Street Pets to illustrate different points along the way. You know, every time that I find a, a systemic uh, a weakness or a potentially exploitable issue, it's like somebody did it on Wall Street Pets, you know, and, and this is how it plays in. So World of Chaos, is, you know, I start the book talking about this because at the time it was fascinating. It was this, this high school kid, uh, you know, that he, he started trading with uh, 900 bucks um, and uh, over a series of trades, 10 trades, or 10 days, he turned that into $55,000, if you can believe that, 900 bucks to 55 grand, uh, you know, high school senior, and he got attention from the press and it was a huge deal back then. Now, nowadays, you don't even make the front page uh, of, of the subreddit, but you know, it was kind of a cool story because this is the su success, you know, this guy made it, you know, he's about to go to college. We all know what that costs. And, you know, this is really going to get him a helping hand when it leaves and, and it embodied, and it does still embody the essence of what is people, you know, what, what it is that Wall Street Bets is about, what it is that people are doing. They're looking to make some money and they occasionally hit these grand slams. You know, like I said, Nowadays, 900 to 55 grand is, is you know, featherweight division. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, folks, when you, when you look at the chapters in here, um, uh, and I love the way you laid it out, Jamie. I mean, it's a new generation, a mindset, access, leverage, Schwab meets candy crush, um, <laughs> tools, systemic risks. Wall Street Bets, most valuable player, spotlight future <laughs> conclusion, best of Wall Street Bets. I mean, it, it is a very interesting read, and it gives you a look into that mindset that Jamie and the folks that were really active in this thing, what they were doing, what they were thinking at that time and so forth. Um, so I, I hope that that book does extremely well for you, Jamie. Um, Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Some of the sports side of your interests as well. Maybe this is the next new thing, Jamie. Yeah, the, the, I mean, I am fascinated by this. This is my hobby. This is an obsession. This is not my profession by any means, but it is it is something that I'm very much intrigued about, uh, and I will continue to be. And it's and it's uh, it's interesting any which way you want to cut it, and it's very entertaining. Um, you know, I. I uh, I wrote that book because I wanted to kind of share some of my thoughts and predictions. A lot of these predictions are coming very true, very fast. I, I never predicted them so fast, but, you know, the tendencies are clear. Um, you know, as far as sports, I don't know if you're talking about actual sports, where people run around and sweat, or if you're talking about something else, but I, you know, I, this is, this is a hobby uh, of mine, one that I'm very passionate about, obviously. Um, uh, you know, outside of this, I have a family, I have a wife, I have a set of, three-year-old twins that keep me pretty busy. I uh, uh, do all sorts of things for work. So it's, uh, you know, I try to keep myself busy, that's for sure. Well, you've done that in spades. And yeah. again, folks, uh, that book, I didn't read the whole title, but it's Wall Street Bets, How Boomers Made the World's Biggest Casino for Millennials. And um, uh, I, I think you'd be very in, uh, entertained by the stories and by Jamie's take on exactly what was going on uh, in Wall Street bets in that community at the time. Um, Thank you. So Jamie, with, uh, with all of these speaking engagements, uh, opportunities to go on with uh, all these folks on, you know, maybe one of these days CNBC will indeed put you on there. I'm <laughs> sure that would have been, we would have broke the needle today if we had you on <laughs> instead of Leon Cooperman. I mean, Leon's a friend of mine, but I'd love to have had that conversation while it's timely right now, while yeah. people are trying to, you know, uh, some people, as, as you heard Chamath perhaps say, he was sticking up for the retail trader, as am I. Um, and he was saying, Scott, what, why, do you have, why is it your responsibility to tell somebody they can't trade and make money? Well, because it's going to end badly. How do you know? Just like you're yeah. saying, Jamie, do you think these guys, these gals, aren't going to buy puts? If GameStop starts starts collapsing, do they yep. only have one mindset that they can only see it going to five thousand dollars? 
or are they perhaps, perhaps smart enough, nimble enough to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to take some of this money that I've made, some of this hundred thousand million, 10 million, whatever, and I'm going to put it on some puts and I'm going to bet on this. I think they are. And I think it's not any of our place to say you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Look, at the end of the day, I, they want to call me. I don't want to call me. I could just, like I've done all the morning shows. All I've booked through all the prime time ones. All the different. I mean, you name it. I've, I, I'm on it or will be on it. And I'm I'm happy to be able to share my perspective on this. I'm happy to be, uh, you know, to 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 witness this. And it, it truly is a fascinating point. And I do believe this is just the beginning of of a story that's starting to unfold. We'll see how things play out. There's no guessing. People asking me to. To guess, I took a few shots in the dark earlier in the week when things were still premature. I, it's fair to say that I was wrong, so I'm not even going to try to guess anymore. Um, uh, you know, let's 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 watch this, let's enjoy this, let's let's appreciate what's happening because it truly really is a special moment. Yeah, and you know, on, on the one hand, I'm sure it's a love hate relationship, Jamie, with Wall Street bets because not not with you, but I mean with Wall Street bets. On the one hand, Wall Street has to love it because 60 million contracts, are you crazy? <laughs> of course they love that. You know, yeah. all of that stock, you know, when it trades 140 million, 190 yeah. million shares in GameStop, because it's done that, folks, this week. When it's done that, you don't think Wall Street wants to say, God, how do we keep this going? <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if we've got this much interest in this, maybe we do have the world's greatest casino going on. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Well, Jamie, you've been a gentleman um, and very generous with your time. Thank you, sir. Not a problem. Um, Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Oh, thank you. Folks, again, that's Jamie Rogozanski. Jamie is the founder of Wall Street Bets. He has that book, which I already described, Wall Street Bets, How Boomers Made the World's uh, Biggest Casino for Millennials or whatever. I think it's fabulous. And Jamie, I hope you enjoy the evening. Uh, with Thank your lovely you. wife and family. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Likewise. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you, sir.